Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. I'm very happy today uh, to be introducing to you the second the CIP Collabs expert talk on uh, petroleum systems evaluation in the Mexico and Gulf of Mexico, a return on experience. Um, I'm glad to be having today with me uh, two of our experts in BC. Uh, of course, uh, maybe you might know uh, Guillermo Perez Drago and Emerson Marfisi. So um, Guillermo is um, uh, is an exploration geologist uh, at the CIP Lab as a petroleum uh, system modeling expert. He joined the CIP uh, uh, in the fluid and basin modeling team since 2011, and he has gained a, a strong professional and academic international experience in, in many basins, um, assessing conventional but also unconventional plays in Mexico, in the USA, in Canada, in Argentina, Bolivia, the Eastern Mediterranean, Malaysia, and, uh, and West Africa. All his professional work focuses on the characterization and modeling of hydrocarbon generation, migration, and, uh, and charge of geochemical and reservoir fluids subsurface behavior. So welcome, Guillermo, with us today. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Emerson Marfisi. Uh, Emerson has 17 years of experience in, uh, in the interpretation and integration of surface and subsurface uh, geological and geophysical data. Uh, his work focused a lot on uh, stratigraphic and basin modeling applied to petroleum system characterization. Um, he obtained his PhD in geology from the uh, University of Sorbonne, Pierre Marie Curie in France, and he later joined the CIP Grand Lab as a senior geologist specialized in stratigraphic and basin modeling. His experience is mainly centered uh, around uh, petroleum system characterization and long term evolution of sedimentary systems. And in 2014, he was appointed project manager and he led integrated studies on petroleum systems of West Canada and the Gulf of Mexico. So, uh, Emerson, welcome, uh, welcome today with us also for this uh, nice webinar. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, Guillermo, for being here. Um, thank you to every one of you for being present for this uh, webinar session. So just before we begin the webinar, uh, I just need to uh, inform you that you have uh, four main uh, simple guidelines. All of you attendees are automatically muted. Um, if you have any questions during the presentations, please don't hesitate to write down your question on uh, the question poll up there. Uh, and uh, also we might be asking you uh, some poll questions. So uh, just to make sure at the end of the presentation to answer the poll. And uh, finally, the video will be uh, recorded, so uh, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. So I strongly uh, suggest you follow us on YouTube, but also you follow us on LinkedIn uh, under Basic Lab. So today's agenda will be uh, mainly focused on, uh, uh, first of all, assessing Basic Lab's uh, exploration studies in the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll be having a brief overview about that, and then we'll discuss the first case study which is the Cantarell Giant Field, um, a petroleum system assessment in structured complex domains. And then we'll discuss a bit about forward modeling techniques and experience that we gathered in the area. And finally, we'll also discuss a, a second case study uh, on Mexican bridges, uh, frontier basins, and uh, petroleum systems assessment. And then please don't hesitate at the end to um, kick off all the questions. Uh, I will be asking uh, our expert uh, the questions uh, depending on uh, on, uh, on you know on, on which which one's expertise is, but uh, I, I wish you enjoy this presentation and uh, and Guillermo, it's uh, it's up to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas, for this presentation, and thank you all of you for being present here. And I hope all this uh, this presentation will find it interesting because we uh, we spent some time to prepare it for you. So we hope you will find it interesting. So first of all, I want to introduce the basic friend lab expertise we have had in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have had the opportunity um, the, to work and to col collaborate in a consult as a consultancy company in a strategic uh, position with national oil company Pemex, also international oil companies, energy regulators as ENH and EMP. All of this since 2014. So which kind of studies and consultancy, consultancy have we done? Well, we have been working in the evaluation of the petroleum potential and exploration strategy advisory. This including petroleum system evaluation in basic modeling and forward stratigraphic modeling, risk and uncertainty assessment for prospective resource estimation, lead and prospect evaluation for exploration portfolio support. 
and all of this within conventional conventional in offshore basins and unconventional resource assessment in onshore basins. So here at the right side, you will see this uh, the position of our regional studies that are mainly done by for Pemex. So you will see we have worked and we have regional studies in the southern Gulf of Mexico in Campeche area, in deep basins in the Salina Basin, also in uh, Perdido Fall Belt, Mexican ridges, and onshore in Burgos and Tampico Misantla Basin. So after I will be a, a more detailed description about these studies. So our general workflow, integrated petroleum system workflow, it's uh, including all of these uh, cartoon images. So we are uh, interested in characterizing the source rock in geochemical characterization. We, are, we have performed stratigraphic, uh, forest stratigraphic modeling, uh, considering uh, stratigraphy, sequence stratigraphy techniques. Uh, lithospheric thermal modeling for heat flow prediction, source rock maturity and hydrocarbon generation and charge assessment, pore pressure prediction, uh, hydrocarbon fluid types and composition, and unconventional resource assessment, and uncertainty and risk analysis for as well for resource assessment. So, well, this is the complete uh, uh, workflow we have we apply in BASIP in, for different studies. So I would like to first make, uh, in the case studies, we'll be explaining um, a little bit of each one of these, um, these uh, areas. But first of all, I want to make a zoom within the Southern Gulf of Mexico. So we have performed uh, here in this map, sorry, we have uh, the polygons, the blue polygons correspond to the basic front lab exploration studies we have performed. Uh, essentially for Pemex in, uh, in this area. So here in the southern uh, Gulf of Mexico shallow waters, we have worked in Leacash Basin, Amoca Basin, Yaxia Nab, and Kumalov Sab areas. In deep offshore basins, we have worked in Bolol Chukta, uh, Olok, Hantemoa, Yokeixik, and Sayab. So as you probably are aware of, all of these areas are uh, very hot in terms of new discoveries since 2014 for Discovery SAMA, for international, of course, international oil company discovery, and the recent discoveries of ENI and um, Repsol are in, within these areas. And here, this is a cross section, the localization, the location of the uh, one cross section that I will use as an example for a case study. In the northern Gulf of Mexico, we have uh, worked as well in the Perdido Fault Belt. So it's a compressive system, a distal system. In subsaline fall and thrust belt, in mini basin, uh, the shale, uh, shale tectonics basin controlled. In the southern area, in Mexican ridges, we have also a case study in, that is within this area. And for our own conventional resources, we have worked in uh, Burgos Basin and Tampico Misantla Basin for the assessment of uh, Pimienta, Taman, and Oxfordian uh, source rocks. Okay. So let's pass uh, directly to our first case study. So this case study, we haven't published it yet because we were, we were planning to publish it within uh, APG or EG international congresses, but given, but given the, the worldwide the pandemic situation, uh, we have to cancel this uh, publication. So you will be the first to see the results of this work we have done. So uh, as many of you already know, uh, because it's a very world, world known uh, reservoir and field, the Cantal complex is a carbonate uh, natural fracture reservoir. Uh, oil field and discovered in the late 70s by Pemex. It's composed by five uh, mega fields, uh, being the Akal field, this one, uh, the largest one with the incredible amount of 32 billion barrels of equivalent oil initially in place. So this corresponds to the hanging wall of the structure and it's uh, underlined by the foot wall uh, called the Hill field that has uh, as well a significant amount of 1.2 billion barrels initially in place. So you will say why to make a personal system study in this field? Because Cantal, uh, Cantal complex has been studied for several decades 
and its exploitation production reaches a mature development stage. But, uh, however, uh, several questions remain. So, which are these questions? So, these questions are related to the mechanical and geochemical processes occurring during the trap and fault thrust formation. And, uh, of course, the synchronous thermofluid dynamics. So, therefore, the, the title of this presentation will be a Cantarell Giant Oil Field Fault Thrust Kinematic Evolution and Synchronous Thermofluid Dynamics. So, the questions we are, uh, <clears throat> the, the main questions we have in, in our head were how was the thermal pressure evolution between the overlying ACAL and the Seahill blocks during fault thrust deformation? What was the timing of hydrocarbon expulsion and the fluid migration interactions between both blocks? How was the evolution of the and the fluid composition PVT phase behavior during charge? And very important as well, what are the implications for near field exploration in, as Jurassic place, as deep uh, place that uh, are undiscovered, such as Kimmeridgen olites or Oxfordian sands? So the main um, problem or the main um, challenge in order to answer these questions is how to simulate petroleum systems and fluids in such a complex structural compressive domain. So the answer, it has, uh, it's, we are using uh, the last technology that IFP has developed, that is Kronos Flow. Uh, IFP and BASIP have uh, we have developed this new technology. So it consists Kronos Flow. It's a kinematic restoration tool, meshing tool. It's very important to add this meshing tool, and uh, it's uh, coupled with basing modeling. So therefore, we we're going to reconstruct our section to an unfolded, uh, undeformed uh, face. We'll we'll uh, um, we'll understand the evolution of the thrust belt. And at the, at the same time, we're going to reproduce the thermal and pressure regimes, hydrocarbon fluid flows, taking consideration a full Darcy law. Only a brief introduction within the stratigraphy and sediment in sedimentary model. So the Akal field, we have the juxtaposition of the upper Jurassic sequences above uh, the Sea Hill block which ha has the repetition of this main, the same sequences. So you will see that the main reservoir, it's of course the Cantarell Breccia, as we widely know. So this is a upper Cretaceous tertiary uh, Breccia cr created by the impact of Chicxulub crater and the gravitary flow deposits in the shelf. So it's very wide known, this a uh, super reservoir extremely high quality reservoir properties. And uh, and then in the sea heat block, we see this repetition of the reservoirs. In terms as well of secondary reservoirs, we can also identify the upper Jurassic uh, Kimia region Olai shoals, not with a not such extensive uh, deposition, but more uh, deposited in the in the head of uh, structural hives, the remnants of the Ju uh, early Jurassic drifts, deposited in the Kimmer region, and as well underlied by the Oxfordian sands that are deposited more in a ramp-like uh, Sapka shore face environment. And uh, in terms of seal, the seal is the um, upper Jurassic Paleocene uh, shales. I, I like to call it uh, uh, stardust deposits because it's really as well the dejecta the uh, radiogenic uh, iridium content of shale that is giving these high properties of, of seal and permeability and capillary pressure. And of course, the, uh, the king of the source rock, the upper Jurassic source rock, the Titonian Taman Pimienta source rock, with very good quality in terms of source rock potential. Regarding the structural style and kinematic deformation, well, several authors agree to disagree in which is the main mechanism of deformation. And, but at least what we can say that it's a complex fold and thrust belt with strike slip uh, displacement. And for the, in this uh, case study, where you're considering a fault propagation fold, 
detaching in Calovian salt, in Middle Jurassic salt. So we identify a first phase, early first phase of uh, compressional deformation involving major folding during the probably upper Jura Cretaceous until lower Miocene. So the upper Jurassic Cretaceous, upper Cretaceous is very sig uh, low significance shortening, but we have more folding during the lower Miocene. A second deformation uh, phase occurs during the middle upper Miocene. It's more thrusting than folding. And finally, we have a pure Pleistocene translational strike slip fault system at the back limb of the of the crest of the both structures, Akal and Sihil. So this is Chronox flow. This is our structural kinematic restoration tool. So we are taking consideration the all the comments we said before. So for this case, we are uh, we're considering a fault propagation fault scenario. We have 18 steps of restoration layers, including source rock, seals, reservoirs, and carrier beds. The present day section length, it's of uh, 24 kilometers. So it's a field scale uh, section applied to for basic modeling purposes. And the maximum section length is 33 kilometers during the, during the Jurassic. And the total shortening, it's of nine kilometers, meaning 27%. So the kinemat kinematic restoration, as I mentioned before, it's made with Chronos flow. So this is a tool such as uh, 2D move or DNL 2D. But the main significance of Chronos flow after the, the reconstruction, the kinematic re reconstruction, it's a meshing tool. So we're going to mesh these restoration steps. And after, we will make some basic modeling techniques in order to assess the heat flow transfer for pressure uh, effective stress uh, modeling and fluid flow modeling as well. Okay, so I will show you the first, uh, the results in terms of simulated thermal pressure regimes. So here in this uh, left side, you will see the an animation of two properties, temperature and pore pressure through geological time. So and they are uh, so you will see the interaction of the mesh that is deformed through time. It's an unstructured mesh. I forgot to say that uh, because we are not taking in consideration. It's not a vertical component uh, kinematic tool, but it's also taking consideration lateral displacement. So we don't have this problem of multi seed um, depth. So the and here at the right side we have some graphs showing the evolution of temperature and the evolution of pressure for both the acal structure and the sihil on their thrusted structure. So what would, do we see at uh, at present day? We have uh, that reservoir present day reservoir temperature is between eighty to one hundred and fifty degrees. Present day reser reservoir pressure. It's around 20 to 45 megapascal uh, with a slight overpressure with six to eight megapascal. So this is above hydrostatic pressure. And as well, uh, we can, uh, so therefore we are considering that uh, Akal and Sihil blocks are hydraulically connected. We'll see a more in detail this, uh, this area. So in these graphs, we will see the evolution. So we see that at the time of the thrusting during the lower Miocene, we begin to see the increase of temperature for the Sihil block underlying the Cal field, and the same for the pressure. So at the end of the present day, we have these temperatures and the evolution at each time step of the geological time. Regarding the simulated thermal source rock maturity, through geological time, well, we, we can identify that the entry of oil window occurs during the upper Miocene and an early stage of early expulsion during upper Miocene and lower Pliocene. So as well, here we have the vitreous reflectance and the source rock transformation ratio 
this is dependent, of course, of a kinetic model. So we are using a compositional kinetic model for a type two uh, marine source rock, carbonate source rock, that is reacting uh, through through uh, through, te through temperature and time. And after uh, here at the right side, we see the evolution of this vitreous reflectance. So at the end of the story, we can uh, estimate that the main peak of oil expulsion of hydrocarbons uh, occur after the fall and thrust formation. It is very important to notice. So what about the fluids? So source rock are expelling hydrocarbons at uh, Lake Niacin. So in this section, we are showing the, the hydrocarbon saturation as property. Here are the source rocks, reservoirs, and uh, in arrows, red in, uh, in black arrows, we are representing hydrocarbon equation vectors. So we can see the hydrocarbon expulsion first began in the sea hill block. This is uh, common because we are uh, expelling at greater depths and the burial depths. And at this at the same time, given that the source rock is in close proximity to the reservoirs, the kitchen is in close proximity to the reservoirs, we have a fast hydrocarbon charge within the sea hill block to bring in KT breccia. Also, we observe a lateral downward migration towards the meridian place within the food wall sea hill block. Next, in the Pliocene, 2,000 million years ago, two, 2 million years ago, sorry, uh, we have this uh, particular event. So we can see it even since before. You can see here in the model, we are predicting a lateral leakage of, uh, from Sea Hill that it's leaking towards the Akal structure. Why is this? Because Akal, um, Akal sequences are mainly sandstone, laminated la sandstones. So they are uh, they can uh, work as a carrier bed. In this case, they are they are decreasing the potential retention capacity of the hill block, and we are uh, leaking towards a cal trap. Here we have some cartoons showing these mechanisms in which the faults are just we have a fault seal juxtaposition and therefore hydrocarbon leakage. So we can say that. Uh, a cal field was mainly fed by sea hill block. But as well, we have some lateral migration of the blocks from the flanks of a cal. They're also contributing to this charge, to this uh, 32 billion barrel charge. And finally, uh, well, the a cal field is almost charged with spill points, not entirely, in, in vertical leakage from sea hill and lateral drainage flanks. And as well at this time, uh, present day, we can see some oil seepages that are present in the, in the Campeche Bay. And therefore, uh, we, if they are biodegraded oils, whereas the reservoirs inside, the, the oil inside the reservoir, they are not biodegraded. So in order to resume, this is the hydrocarbon charge history for the Recha, the Cretaceous Recha. So we see that the Sea Hill block uh, begins a uh, early charge since the upper Miocene with a 20, 20 API and 200 uh, GOR standard cubic feet per barrel. So it's uh, hydrocarbons that are expelled directly from source rock with no secondary cracking or curing. They are mostly primary cracking uh, uh, kerogen from kerogen. And here we see the leakage of the hill field and the immense charge, the, the great um, charge within the Akal block, which at the end of the story, we are reproducing the 22 API and 350 barrels, uh, cubic feet per barrels. So here, at the end of the day, for the hill block, we have 1.2 billion barrels. And for the um, Akal field, we have 32 billion barrels. So what about the, well, here I already talked about a little bit of, of the properties of the fluids, but I will uh, show a little bit more detail in this slide. So given that we are considering a compositional kinetic scheme, we are able to identify uh, 
the different, the different components of light, medium, heavy oil in order to give us a, uh, an effective API prediction that they are uh, reacting in primary and secondary cracking uh, reactions. And also we'll have uh, two gas, two gas um, uh, components of methane and C2C5. So what are the initial conditions of uh, cantarel field before production? So before production, the both fields were under saturated oils. This means that they were above um, bubble point pressure, meaning that the gas is dissoluted within the oil and it's not, uh, we don't have the presence of gas cap. The gas cap was uh, created after, during production, once the bubble point pressure reached, once the, the reservoir pressure reached bubble point pressure. So here, this is a PVT flow. This is another software of, uh, we are using BASIF in order to have a detailed description of PVT phase behavior of our fluids. And this is the compositional mole, mole composition of the acal field, number one, and the Sihil field, number two. So pressure saturation. So a very important comment here is that we see uh, there are, this is now very important work made by Pemex in Leon, I think in the late 90s, uh, where they are describing that we have a uniform PVT properties versus depth in a cal, meaning that at different depth within the flanks of the structure, we have almost the same PVT properties, API and GUR. So it's, they are very uniform. So after we'll see which is the origin of this uh, uniform PVT properties. So we have a PSAT pressure saturation of 15 megapascal for the ACAL block, 18 megapascal for the Sihilon block, 22 towards 26 to 30 degrees API and GUR. And the initial conditions where we have our oil water comp as well described from this publication of Pemex at 3,200 uh, 3, meters below sea level. And we, uh, pre we are uh, assuming that the water contact for Sea Hill is at 3,800 3, meters, the oil water contact. So well, here it's only to show the simulated versus the laboratory PVT analysis. So we have a very good correlation between a simulated compositional model of Chronos flow temis and with the lab PVT data. So next slide, I will show you, uh, we, we talked before about these um, uniform PVT properties. So this author I told before, Pemex is Leon et al. since nine, uh, 1995. They made this amazing work for in order to understand the initial PVT, uh, uh, pre PVT uh, fluid properties in during uh, at initial conditions in the reservoir. So what do we see? We see that in, in terms of thermal gradient at the crest of the fold, we see a, a lower, a normal thermal gradient at this position. So we can see it here at these iso simulated isotherms. We have a, a decrease in this isotherm 90 degrees. And uh, so this effect in terms of uh, temperature, it's creating a, a fluid convection in high thermal reservoirs. So this is a common uh, phenomena occurring in natural fracture reservoirs in uh, other places in the world. But uh, this author, they, they believe that this is one of the main answers of why we have PVT uniform properties. So this is a small cartoon to show how does it work. So hot fluids are moving upwards and cold fluids are moving downwards, given this thermal gradient on conformity. So why is it this? It's because the breccia, cantarel breccia has amazing uh, properties. It has uh, uh, porosity is higher than 50%. So it's primary, secondary and tertiary porosity. So it's inherited intercrystalline boogie and fracture porosity. It has excellent permeability from um, 3,000 to 500 milliDarcy, so it is uh, huge. And uh, it's believed that it's a dissolution and dolomitization processes. So we have hydrothermal fluid cars creating this uh, voguey porosity. 
Okay, it's only to uh, to finish and to make some conclusions and recommendations about this um, this uh, study. So the hydrocarbon charge occurred mainly after the fall and frost that traps were formed. Uh, hydraulically connected Akalsi hill blocks uh, have independent water oil contacts after Aquino et al. 2003. So this means that we have an open open permeable sea hill faults that are permeable across and along the fault plane. And the only and the barriers are the lithology itself that are in juxtaposition. So and the oil remanent within the sea hill block, it's mainly controlled by top capillary pressure of the Paleocene seal. Uh, after a capital reservoir, as you already mentioned, is fed by the sea hill leakage through the Oxfordian salt, sand, sorry, in a lateral fold seal juxtaposition. And uh, in order to conclude about this uniform PBT properties, well, Leon G. et al. in 1995 explained because we have a reservoir fluid convection phenomena. But uh, in, I believe that uh, it's also possible that we are expelling source rock uh, from the, from, we're expelling hydrocarbon from source rocks that are in uh, close proximity to the uh, high probability reservoir. So not giving time to have secondary cracking uh, um, mechanisms. So they, therefore, they are migrating directly to the to the top of the structure. Also, Kimmeridgian Oxford and Play uh, has a great role in within this uh, model. We see this downward lateral migration, and the main risk within this play will be the lateral fold seal and the trap quality. So therefore, this kind of studies such as Kronos Flow. Uh, we, we see it like that. Chrono Slow is an effective tool for near field, near field exploration in complex structural domains, given that we will assess the petroleum system analysis, false analysis, and hydrocarbon fluid PVT behavior. So, only a small um, reminder here all this work has made with 100% published data, calibrated with published data, but nevertheless, it can be. Uh, Customize and increase in terms of uh, data with uh, well, with new data, with 3D seismic data, and with uh, full data of, of clients. So thank you very much. Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you very much. Uh, just before Emerson uh, kicks off, um, we have some we have many questions. If we can go through the questions a bit quickly because the subject will change later. Uh, yes. Let's uh, let's kick off with uh, with some of the questions. Uh, quick answers as much as possible and more concise, please. Sure. So, uh, first of all, from um, uh, from uh, Mr. Agrawal, what is the total stratigraphic thickness um, of the system that you uh, that you modeled? What is the what? Sorry. The, the total stratigraphic thickness. You can read the presentation on your question. Yes, the total stratigraphic sequence for what for this area. We are believing that the top of the salt, it's around uh, ten kilometers depth. So we have this shallow water, so we are in uh, we're the same thing. Uh, we're below mud level, below mud level, we are in ten kilometers, nine kilometers depth. Okay. A second question from uh, Mr. Kumar uh, from ONGC: uh, How have you addressed the compaction of carbonates in the modeling? Yes. Uh, well, compaction in uh, the model, we have different lithologies. Of course, the the section is is uh, dressed with faces. So the carbonates are considered inside. So we're taking consideration vertical uh, compaction. So the carbonates have uh, different densities, of course, than shale or sands. So we're taking consideration different special compaction curves for each lithology. So you use the compaction curve of, uh, of uh, the IFP database, or did you have any compaction curves provided to you? No, it's, like it's, it's more mainly from the database. Okay. and. Of course, we have we're calibrating with the observed data of the okay. this high porosity, uh, porosity and permeability. Okay. Another question from Mr. Chang from BHP Petroleum: Why yeah. is the leaked fluids in Akal heavier than underlying seal fluid? Higher yeah. NOI and GOR. Yes, uh, very good question. This is because the kitchen that it's feed, feeding sea hill block well, it's deeper than the Akal. And therefore, we are uh, we, as well. We have a higher uh, temperatures, 
So we are entering in a secondary cracking within the Sigil field as well. Okay, a question from Mr. Sanchez from Ecopetrol. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible to simulate secondary porosity in Kronos, for instance, carbonate dissolution or microfracturing? For the moment, in Kronos, not yet. We have this in uh, Temis Flow, but uh, it's a new, uh, this is a new subject that will be, will be developing in IFP and BASIC, of course. A question from Mr. Delgado uh, from Pemex. What is the size ratio of Camp Akal and Camp Sihil? And what is the potential of Camp Sihil? The potential? Well, the initial potential of Sihil, it's one, I think it's the P50, the estimation of Pemex, it's 1.2 billion barrels. Probably, uh, well, this is from uh, publications, of course. And probably now it's, we have a new uh, new data from the 3D seismic, but at least from the Sihil, we have 1.2 billion barrels P50, and uh, in Akal, 32 billion barrels. Okay. In place, uh, original in place, of course. A question from uh, Mrs. Karina Vasquez from Winterschall. Uh, have you considered the difference in the API could be related to different uh, charge pulses through time? Yes, of course. Yeah, that's what we are assessing, of course, the it's not the it's it's the thermal kinetic modeling. We are considering three three liquid phases: light, medium, and heavy components. So these heavy components are reacting to a kinetic uh, Arrhenius law. So of course they are evolving in time. They, we don't we see that probably from source rock expulsion we are uh, twenty API nineteen API, and when once we are uh, migrating towards the top of the structure, we reach to this 22 API. Uh, okay, so three questions left. The first one from Mr. Agrawal from uh, BTRL. Considering leaking of fluid and migrating into the overlying reservoir, a cal field fluid should present properties of mixed type of hydrocarbons? If yes, how do you decipher that? So what was the last comment? Uh, if yes, so yes. Yeah, if, if yes, how do you decipher that or how do you identify that? Yes, so we have, we have different compositions, of course, but as we uh, explained, we have this mechanism of uh, fluid convection that we are arriving to uh, reproduce it in our basin model, given the high permeability of the model and the thermal gradient variation. So we have mostly uniform PVT, uh, API and GOR properties with slight variations, of course, with depth. So the thermal trend on the slide 21 yeah. could also be explained by underlying conductive heat transfer impact from salt, from underlying salt. Yes, of course, yes, the, the salt it's, uh, has high conductivity. So we have, uh, it's not a high, it's not a diapir, of course. But yes, it's uh, working as a heat transfer. There, there, that's why the heel block, it's, uh, its uh, temperature of thermal gradient is higher than in uh, a cal field. So yes, and the convective fluids, why are we, um, why do we have these convective fluids? It's because of temperature uh, gradients difference. So we have a high, lower thermal gradient at the top and a higher thermal gradient at the flanks. But yes, I agree that it could be uh, uh, as well uh, due to the salt it's uh, more uh, highly uh, thermal conductivity. So the final question from Mr. Agrawal, can you please explain downward lateral migration a bit more? Yes, so we have uh, the juxtaposition of, well, the Titonian source rock is upper Jurassic and the uh, Kimeridian, uh, it's below, Kimeridian olites. So at the time we have this juxtaposition between both between uh, between the source rock and these olites, we can uh, in, we can occur this downward migration, uh, downward or lateral migration. But so therefore, uh, hydrocarbons tend to flow to less to high permeability zones. So in some hydrocarbons, instead of migrating vertically upwards, can migrate downwards as well if they are in contact direct with this porous olite reservoir. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Guillermo, for your answers. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your investment in this. 
Emerson, you uh, your turn. Sorry, uh, we uh, we cut you short on this, but uh, many questions arose uh, at this at this time. Thank you. No, that that's totally fine. Thank you, thank you. Um, after this interesting presentation from Guillermo, I want just to have some words on forward stochiatic modeling. So behind all this uh, experience on paternal system modeling, we have been working also a lot on the modeling of the different, uh, I would say, reservoir cell distribution in all the Mexican sites. So I would say in onshore and offshore. So yeah, we have been working a lot on the turbidite from the Miocene or Eocene system in the Campeche area, um, the, paleogen the Paleogen and Cretaceous breccia and carbonate deposits, the Cimeridian old lights and the Euphorian sandstone. So we have been actually um, simulating the distribution of these phases to understand which part of the system will be more um, interesting in terms of reservoirs. So this have been a work in parallel and um, have been incorporated into the petroleum system modeling um, workflow. So this has been done uh, for many projects um, and don't, I'm not going to specify all, all the work that have been done, but just to give you a flavor um, the um, kind of studies we have been done. So in the image in the, we can see in the center, um, we see, yeah, thank you, Guillermo. We see that um, we have um, the image of the transit of sediment from the onshore to the offshore, just to give you an idea of the simulation of the sediment pathway from the onshore to, to the deep basin. This is for mostly for the turbidites deposits and the Miocene or Eocene in Cambridge. So if we go to the next slide, probably if you're not familiar with this technology, I will mention that we are applying Dionysus flow to having a 4D simulation of the evolution of the filling of the basin. So we can work at, um, I will say, a, a basin scale or a more strict um, field scale to, to get a complete framework of distribution of seals or reservoir in the area. So this is a way to, I will say, um, put all the information you have in a single platform. So the idea is to uh, match the biostatography, the um, seismic interpretation, your attributes, and put all together in a more coherent stratigraphic framework. So I can give you later for those who would like to get more information on this. We, we have been doing some dedicated webinars on this subject, and we can um, even do more, uh, give you more details in, in, if you ask. If we move to the next slide, yeah, well, um, just a few words so, on the modeling of the Miocene turbidite in Campeche. Actually, which is interesting, modeling this system is the, the kinetic of the soil. So we have been uh, working a lot, understanding the first, uh, I will say, um, action of the kinetic of the flow of the, of the salt. So we are just looking at the places that are having more subsidence through time. Those areas will be depot centers. So most of your turbidite will be going to that place. And then when we're changing or having inversion of the basin, you will be getting you know, those sandy deposits at the top of the diapirs. So this is just to give you an idea of the kind of modern results you can get applying this technology. And at the end of the day, you will be able to get some maps of, of uh, the sand shale proportion for every one of your targets in the basin. If you move to the next slide, um, Guillermo, um, as we know, um, a single model is not enough to explain all the variability that you can have in a system like um, the turbidite or even the transport of the breccia from 
from the platform to, to the basin. So that's why we are coupling this forward study of modeling with an uncertainty and risk analysis. So in this slide, I, I want just to show you uh, the idea of having the, uncert the analysis of the sensitivity of the different parameters we use for doing forward study of modeling and look at your results to know which parameter is the most influential parameters impacting your results. So we do a model, I will say a reference model that will give you an idea and that will match your wells and your seismic interpretation. But more than that, we want to know what is the impact if I use, for example, a sediment supply of 167 or 250, what was the difference? What would be changing in my model? So we want to get this sensitivity analysis to have, I would say, a better idea of the behavior of the system. And coupled, coupled with this, we do a risk analysis in the next slide uh, to understand what we're expecting to, to get in the basin. So something very recent that I, I, will, I will say will be probably very interesting to you is the possibility of running risk analysis along the trajectory of your next well. So you can do a stratigraphic modeling and then you can put your next targets and run a model just to see how often you get the sandstone at the position uh, where you're expected to have sandstone. So in this case, you have two wells and in the wells A, you will see that after any simulation, you are getting more or less sandstone in your target, but you're always getting sandstone and to the world to be. So it just gets sandstone in very few models. So it's the risk of finding a reservoir in this well is higher than in the other one. So you can get an idea of the risk of your next location in, in, in the Mexican side um, applying this technology. Um, if you prefer just to have an idea of what is the distribution of your sweet spot, we can do also the um, P90, P50, P10 analysis on, on the basin you are modeling. So this is something you can apply to have an idea of the spatial distribution of the fissures or, or the reservoir or the reservoir or seals or even organic matter in the basin. Um, yeah, that, that's, I'll say, all that I want to share with you today. Guys, don't hesitate to ask more information on this topic. Thank you, Thank you very much. A quick question from uh, Mr. Delgado. How can you know exactly how much lithology you will input in your model and if you depend on the quality of the site size? You know, uh, with forest stratigraphic models, uh, there are many uncertainties. How do you approach them in this case? Okay, that, that's a very good question. So you know the kind, the, there are two ways to know the kind of lithologies. If you're working in a totally unknown basin, uh, you will be taken as a reference, a conceptual model. So if you're expecting to have carbonate, you will put carbonate. If you're expecting to have only plastic, you will be working with plastics. In our case, we have well data and seismic attributes. So we have an idea of the phase or, or the lithologies we are dealing with. So we put these lithologies and we're trying to match the observation using the forward setting of modeling technology. Also a point, uh, Emerson, on this, the importance of using, as you showed, the sensitivity analysis, because sometimes we are not very sure of the amount of volume of sand or shale or clay or, or carbonates into the system. So using the, um, the Cougar flow and the sensitivity analysis also helps in identifying the zones where you have maybe a bit more risk on or uncertainty on your lithology or not. Totally so, true. This has been very appreciated by our clients that have been wondering, okay, what happened if I don't have 20% neck to grass and just only 10%, what is changing in my model? So this is a very, I would say, accurate way to take decisions. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Emerson. Thank you, guys. I would like Guillermo to continue for the yes. next case study. Enjoy. Thank you, Emerson. Very interesting topic. We have more questions. I hesitate. 
So the next case study to continue, it's uh, within a frontier basin in the Mexican regions. So this work has already been presented in an uh, international congress in last year in the a AG. So the title of this uh, presentation was The Origin of Natural Oil Seabed Seepage Along Mexican Ridges, Southwestern Gulf of Mexico, the Petroleum System Implication and Potential. So this was a collaboration between Basic Friend Lab and, of course, the, the Facultad de Ingeniería UNAM. So as you will see here, uh, we are now passing to another scale and another um, uh, maturity of oil industry. So now we are within a frontier basin in a basin scale. So it's important to say that the vast gam of basin modeling we are achieving. So here in this map, you will see in uh, this is offshore uh, Gulf of Mexico, eastern Gulf, western Gulf of Mexico. In green is the oil seepage and in red the gas seepage. And this line represents the position of the section that we will be working with. So which are the uh, main observations? So an active natural oil and gas seafloor seepage is evident with satellite imaging or uh, surface geochemical exploration. So this uh, geochemical assessment indicates there's a source oil correlation indicating a major thermogenic upper Jurassic carbonate rich family source, so the Pimienta Taman uh, source rock. And this is a very interesting work made by Olguin Quinones 2018 in, and TDI Brooks. So they are mentioning the main origin of, of, of these fluids in the seafloor are mainly of upper Jurassic for this area. Next source observation, we see that from the seismic interpretation that the source rock, Upper Jurassic, is lying below 10 kilometers depth, uh, below mud line. So it's a huge uh, depth. So therefore, there is, uh, therefore, this basin has been considered as a predominantly gas-prone province. Uh, is that true? That's what we're going to try to answer. So how to explain liquid rich seabed seepage? What does the petroleum, how does the petroleum system work? And uh, what implications for the hydrocarbon potential for this province? So the objective of this work is to uh, assess the petroleum system elements such as boreal history, thermal pressure regimes, which are responsible for the hydrocarbon expulsion and fluid flow migration and in order to explain seafloor seepage. So the methodology, in this case, we are using a classical 2D basin modeling, which takes in account uh, Temis flow, which takes in account the simulation of heat transfer, compaction effective stress, mechanical and geochemical, and hydrocarbon fluid flow applying a Darcy law through geological time. So what is the structural and geodynamic context for those who don't know this basin? So Mexican Ridge province, it's a gravitary fault and thrust belt sequence uh, involving Miocene and Pliocene classic rocks. And there's no salt here. It's detaching over uh, shaley, uh, over pressure oligocene eocene sequence. So it's a shale tectonics, not a salt tectonics. And the age of deformation is considered to be from Miocene to present day. The geodynamic context, uh, very important. It's we are uh, within a transform paleorist margin that was developed during the late Jurassic until early Cretaceous. So we'll see that in the proximal uh, area, we are talking in the Quetzalcoatl extensional system, which is the extensional part of the whole system. We are underlied by continental crust, thick continental crust, and sharply changing to a transitional and oceanic crust. So this uh, drastic change of necking zone of the crust is due to the transform fault in the opening of the Gulf of Mexico. So if we see the composition and the geometry of the crust will have a huge impact for our next discussion. Regarding the stratigraphy and the sedimentary model, so the main source rock, well, the, the same, Jurassic, Upper Jurassic uh, Pimienta Taman source rock. 
the main reservoir, the main target is the middle upper Miocene, which is through the sands. And a very important element of the petroleum systems, it's the lower Eocene Paleocene, which uh, we believe uh, after Galloway and Aguayo, that it uh, has a carrier bed um, as element in the petroleum system. So how these, these sands arrive towards the basin in the Gulf of Mexico. So during the Paleogen, the adjacent Laramid foreland was uplifted and eroded. So sedimentary uh, can channels and erosional conduits uh, were formed within the, the Jucola Laja and the Chincontepec canyons, boarding, of course, the, the Tuxpan platform. And these sediments were down deep and were down deep deposited uh, with a shelf bypass in the sh uh, within this area and deposited within sand rich deposits in turbidated fans. So this, as we'll see after, it has a huge impact for the petroleum system migration of fluids. Well, uh, this in regarding the seals, we have uh, internal seals within the Miocene. And also an important, very important seal is the overpressure upper Eocene, where we have the detachment surface of the Mexican ridges fall and thrust belt. So we go directly to the simulation results, calibrated simulation results. So here we have the stratigraphy, the thermal gradient, simulated thermal gradient, and the vitreous reflectance. And here in dotted lines, we will see the isotherms are section. So what do we see? We see a relatively low thermal gradient within the synclinals of the structure uh, ranging from 19 to 25. 25 corresponds more to the top of the structures where we have a higher thermal gradient. And uh, so it's a, we can consider it as a low thermal gradient basin. And the Upper Jurassic source rock, uh, it's, it's true. Uh, they are on the line below 10 kilometers. So it's within the dry gas window above 200 degrees. So if we uh, uh, under, try to understand the temperature, thermal maturity evolution through geological time, here the same graph as before, geological time in this axis and temperature in this axis. So we see that during the Cretaceous, we have a low heating rate of 0.5 degrees per million year. This is due to low um, to thermal conductivity of, of carbonates and low sedimentation rate, and a significant increase in thermal uh, heating rates during the Paleocene, changing to 2.3 degrees per million year. So what's the implications for thermal maturity? We see that the oil window entry is during the upper Pliocene. And we have a long extension of the oil window until the upper Miocene. So it's um, almost 50 million years where the salt rock was expelling at least uh, some hydro liquid hydrocarbons. And the really recent Pliocene change to towards a dry gas window uh, with, at present day. So to resume, we have a long duration of the oil window and a recent dry gas window, given the nature of low radiogenic crust, oceanic crust, with, with, as we said before, we have a low thermal gradients through geological time. In terms of pore pressure and effective stress, well, in this section, we are showing um, the same section in terms of uh, effective stress. So effective stress is the pore pressure, the lithostatic pressure minus the pore pressure. So when it's decreasing, we are attaining the fracture gradient. So we are uh, able to, uh, to modelize um, where and when is this fraction gradient attaining. So we see three main overpressure compartments, one with slight overpressure within the middle Miocene, a second one within the lower Miocene Oligocene with higher overpressure, and then the third highly overpressured section within the Oligocene and upper middle Eocene, which corresponds to the detachment zone of the Mexican ridges, which is attained the fracture gradient. So 
fault and thrust belts are formed by faults, and faults are formed by fractures. So at the time we are attaining the fracture gradient, gravitary sedimentary systems, we are creating this fault and thrust belt at this time in the lower Oligocene surface. So this is uh, one of our hypotheses we are considering a smected elite transformation. So this is a shale composition. So this is a phenomena occurring uh, a geochemical reaction when you have a smectite that it's uh, exposed to high temperatures above 60 degrees, which is transforming uh, geochemically to elite and expelling water. So this will uh, decrease the shale permeability and enhancing the fracture gradient. So in terms of historical of fracture gradient, when was it was attained? So this is the effective stress curve at uh, the Eocene Oligocene seal. We are reaching this uh, fracture gradient within the lower middle Miocene. So it's, uh, at the same time, we are creating the fallen thrust structures and the kinematic deformation for this uh, fallen thrust belt. So what is the result of this? So shale fracture gradient reduces seal efficiency. So it increases permeability. We have the rupture of capillary pressure entry of the seal, and therefore we are enhancing vertical migration of fluids. So the historic of fluid uh, migration and charge in time is represented in this slide. So here we are the same, we're considering hydrocarbon saturation at present day, of course. And the oil, we are presenting the oil seepage at the top of the structures. So what was the story of this hydrocarbon charge? So <clears throat> we can see that, well, after hydrocarbons expelled during the lower Eocene, hydrocarbons were retained within the sand rich Paleocene interval, which we mentioned before as it was a carrier bed. So we have oil retention within sand rich Paleocene Eocene sequences since late Oligocene. So the same story, we have we are low, low temperatures below 150, where we have the highest uh, secondary cracking occurring. So therefore, we preserve these liquid hydrocarbons at this depth, at this time, of course, and followed by a fracture gradient uh, seal occurred during the Oligocene. So here, this is the effective seal curve that I showed before. So seal uh, effective stress is reducing at this time, and this corresponds to the time we have a leakage and hydrocarbon dismigration towards shallower reservoirs. So this occurs towards the Miocene reservoirs. And so at this time, we see that we have the charge of Miocene reservoirs, probably a, a, a failure in seal capacity because it's very shallow. The charge is occurring at the same time of charge, the, sorry, the charge is occurring at the same time of trap formation. So seal capacity, top seal capacity is probably low. And finally, the dismigration towards the seafloor seepage. So only to conclude, uh, natural oil seabed seepage in Mexican ridges can be explained as follows, given our, this, uh, this work we have made. So given the nature of low radiogenic crust and the lithospheric thermal equilibrium, there was a long duration of the oil window that uh, had a duration of almost 50 million years and a relatively recent dry gas window with a duration of 5 million years. So this, this and also an early retention with the upper Paleocene sandwich sequences, uh, avoiding secondary cracking and uh, followed by a seal capillary pressure rupture and fracture gradient gradient uh, activation, we are migrating towards the sea bottom and towards the Mexican ridges. So we can say only that the, what are the implications of this? We can say that the Miocene plate traps contain oil or liquid rich gas accumulations in contrast, in contrast what it was believed before that it's a gas prone uh, dry gas reservoirs. 
and the risk of hydrocarbon charge is reduced given that uh, hydrocarbon charge occurred after and during trap formation. So the same disclaimer as before, all this section was made with 100% public data and limited data, of course, and nevertheless, we can make the same kind of studies with full quantity of new data. So, yeah. Thank, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Very much. For, thank you very uh, much. For your presentation. Uh, I think we still have a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know. Um, are you going into your final remarks, or shall we get the questions before? Mm, well, it's only one slide for the final remarks. So probably after the final remarks, we can make the questions. Okay. So final remarks, there it's not conclusions, but only some general overview of our experience in the Mexican Gulf of Mexico. So which are the main risks in the petroleum system elements in the Gulf of Mexico? So source rock, it's not uh, high risk, even that it has a huge distribution, uh, uh, high potential, and uh, it's not, it doesn't represent a major risk. Reservoir presence and quality remains a potential risk, given the uncertainty of sand rich path distribution or fractured current reservoirs. The Gulf of Mexico has plenty of good quality traps and with the new technologies of 3D seismic data, it's, uh, it's, um, it will be easier to identify and delineate these uh, traps. Uh, uh, next, the seal capacity, top seal efficiency, it doesn't represent a uh, risk. However, uh, lateral seal and fault seal do represent a high risk. Uh, in mainly in south relative structures. And hydrocarbon migration and timing are essential for an effective economical hydrocarbon charge, and therefore representing as well a major risk for prospects. So two last points. So all this we have presented, Temis flow, Kronos flow, Denisus flows. We, uh, they are efficient tools to, uh, used by our clients that can be applied along the different phases of oil and gas industry. So as we mentioned before, from field to basin scale, from for frontier to mature basins, in exploration context, or in a, even a production con context. So we know that petroleum system analysis or basin modeling doesn't give the right answer. All models are wrong, but some of them are useful they will allow you to test different scenarios to understand which processes and variables are most critical and sensitive. And therefore, they can be useful for to the risk prospects and leads. So thank you very much. Uh, Guillermo, uh, on this presentation, thank you, Emerson, also uh, for your investment. Thank you very much, guys. Question regarding from, uh, from César. Uh, Delgado, what about the Cretaceous in that area? Do I only know something about the Tuxpan platform? Well, the Cretaceous below Mexican ridges. Well, we uh, we it's probable uh, that we have the Tamabra sequences for the middle Cretaceous as a reservoir, but it's quite very deep. It's uh, so no no wells have been reached within the, the Mexican ridges area. In uh, shallower areas below the two span, of course, yes, it's. Uh... And yeah, and then there is another point regarding the production on the Orizaba platform at seven thousand five hundred CRTM. Come on. We have a production on the Orizaba platform. Yes. At, yeah, at seven thousand five hundred on on CRTM. Yes, well, this the took span, uh, the took span offshore took span system. That of course, it's, it's tilted for from sedentary uh, inputs, so we have higher UR and API than terrestrial took span platform. Yes, uh, I'm just publishing, uh, guys, uh, a poll. Your feedback would be uh, would be great. So uh, don't hesitate to uh, to answer to the poll. You can just you know click uh, on the poll and and, uh, and vote. Uh, another question, do the over for Mr. Um, Shailendra from uh, LAPI ITB, do the overpressure from shale formation as top seal still not become high risk in your conclusion of the Gulf of Mexico? You mean by the, the, the top seal capacity? Yeah, the overpressure from the shale formation as top seal. Yes, yes, in this case, for example, for Mexican ridges, 
given that the traps are really recently formed, yes, the top seal capacity it's uh, reduced. Therefore, uh, we see that's why we see all seepages because it's they're not perfect barriers within the uh, myosin. Okay. okay. Uh, anyone has um, any other question before we leave it there? Uh, so um, I think everyone uh, everyone has enjoyed a lot, uh, Guillermo and Emerson. Uh, thank you for your uh, your experience and, and sharing your knowledge on this. Thank um, you very much. Thank you very much. Before is um, is uh, videotaped, so it will be uh, published on uh, YouTube. Uh, on our YouTube channel. So don't hesitate if you have any questions, uh, even to get back to us um, on LinkedIn or by, uh, by our personal emails. And um, all your comments and your questions uh, were very well appreciated. Uh, have a nice day, everyone, and uh, keep, um, keep following us. We have more, uh, more nice things to come. Uh, and until we meet again, enjoy and stay safe. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you very much. Hasta luego.